Welcome aspirants. I'm going to teach you management. It's a comprehensive crash course in which you'll learn all the broader areas of management. For instance, basic concepts in management, management functions, roles and skills, organizational internal and external environment, management planning, goal setting and decision making strategic management process, developing organizational structure and design, designing adaptive organizations, managing change and innovation, leadership and motivation. Let's start this crash course with basic concepts. So, the question arises: what is management? It involves coordinating and overseeing the work activities of others so their activities are completed efficiently and effectively. Look at the key words. Efficiency means doing things right while effectiveness means doing the right things. So, efficiency is all about means, resources or the usage of resources to get most output for the least inputs while effectiveness is all about ends outcomes or the goal attainment next question arises who is manager then it is someone who coordinates and oversees the work of other people so organizational goals can be accomplished now we have to understand what is an organization any organization has three common characteristics first it is composed of people second it has a distinct purpose or goal third it has a deliberate structure. So, we can say it is a deliberate arrangement of people to accomplish some specific purpose that individuals independently could not complete alone. Now, we are going to discuss levels of management. First comes top managers, second, middle managers, third, first line managers, last but not the least, non managerial employers that involve in the technical activities. There are basically four management functions. First, planning, which involves setting goals, establishing strategies for achieving those goals, and developing plans to integrate and coordinate activities. Second, organizing, which involves arranging and structuring work to accomplish the organizational goals. Third, Leading, which involves working with and through people to accomplish organizational goals. Fourth, controlling, which involves monitoring, comparing, and correcting work performance. All these management functions lead to achieving the organizational stated purposes. Now, we have to understand managerial roles. These are basically specific actions or behaviors expected of and exhibited by a manager there are basically three managerial roles first interpersonal roles that involve people and other duties that are ceremonial and symbolic in nature like figurehead leader liaison second informational roles which involve collecting receiving and disseminating information like monitor, disseminator, spokesperson. Third, decisional roles. These are managerial roles that revolve around making choices like entrepreneur, disturbance handler, resource allocator, negotiator. Now, we have to discuss management skills. Robert L. Katz proposed three critical skills in managing. First, technical skills. Technical skill is the job-specific knowledge and techniques needed to proficiently perform work tasks. Second, interpersonal skills. Interpersonal skill is the ability to work well with other people individually and in a group. Third, conceptual skills. Conceptual skill is the ability to think and to conceptualize about abstract and complex situations. There are some other important managerial skills that employs constantly upgrade in dynamic and demanding workplace like managing human capital, structuring work and getting things done.
managing decision making process inspiring commitment facilitating the psychological and social context of work managing strategy and innovation managing change using purposeful networking managing logistics and technology there are four major approaches to management theory like classical quantitative behavioral and contemporary firstly look at the historical background in which we will find early examples of management for instance egyptian pyramids and great wall of china similarly venetians are also early examples of management venetians are floating warship assembly lines that were used in the past in 1776 adam smith published his very popular book the wealth of nations in which he advocated the division of labor to increase the productivity of workers division of labor means job specialization industrial revolution also provided base to management it was a period during the late 18th century when machine power was substituted for human power that make it possible to produce economical goods at factories then at homes classical approach is first study of management which emphasized rationality and making organizations and workers as efficient as possible the two most important contributors to scientific management theory were frederick w taylor and the husband wife team of frank and leland gilbreth the two most important contributors to general administrative theory were henry foyle and max weber let's take a look at each of these important figures in management history the scientific management is to use scientific method to define one best way for a job to be done the scientific method could be putting right person on job with correct tools and equipments or having a standardized method of doing the job or providing an economic incentive to worker frederick winslow taylor was the father of scientific management and he published his book principles of scientific management in 1911 that gave birth to modern management theory bear in mind taylor gave four principles of scientific management first develop a science of each element of an individual work to replace the old rule of thumb second scientifically select and then train teach and develop the worker third cooperate with workers wholeheartedly to ensure that all work is done in accordance with the principles of science that has been developed fourth divide work and responsibility between management and workers and management takes over all work for which it is better fitted than workers frank and lillian gilbert focused on increasing work productivity through reduction of wasted motions they invented a device called as micronometer that recorded a worker's hand and body motions and the amount of time which is spent doing each motion management used scientific management in contemporary world to increase productivity and to design incentive system based on output of best qualified employees the next classical approach is general administrative theory henry fall introduced 14 principles of management that apply to all organizational situations he believed that practice of management was distinct from other organizational functions and the 14 principles of management that he provided are first division of work second authority third discipline fourth unity of command fifth unity of direction sixth subordination of individual interest to all general interest seventh remuneration eighth centralization ninth scalar chain means line of authority from top management to lower rank tenth order eleven equity twelve stability 13 initiative 14 as per the corps which means promoting team spirit will build harmony and unity 
within the organization. The second important contributor in this theory is Max Weber, who developed a theory of authority based on an ideal type of organizations like bureaucracy. He emphasized rationality, predictability, impersonality, technical competence, and authoritarianism. According to Max Weber, a bureaucracy should have division of labor, authority hierarchy, formal selection, formal rules and regulations, impersonality, and career orientation. The next approach is quantitative approach. It is also called operations research or management science. It was evolved from mathematical and statistical methods developed to solve World War II military logistics and quality control problems. It focuses on improving managerial decision making by applying statistics, optimization models, information models, and computer simulations. Other quantitative techniques are also used to management activities, like linear programming is used to improve resource allocation decisions. Similarly, work scheduling can be more efficient as a result of critical path scheduling analysis. Another example is economic order quantity model, which helps managers determining optimal inventory levels. It's another area in TQM, means total quality management, where quantitative techniques can be applied. Managers use quantitative approach in the contemporary world in queue management. Furthermore, this approach directly contributes to management decision making in areas of planning and control. For example, when managers make budgeting, queuing, scheduling, quality control, and similar decision, they typically rely on quantitative approach. Next important approach is behavioral approach. People are the most important asset of an organization. So, organizational behavior is the study of actions of people at work. Early OB advocates are Robert Owen, Hugo Munsterberg, Mary Parker, and Chester Barnard. Robert Owen concerned about deplorable working conditions. According to him, money spent on labor is a smart investment. So, organizations should focus on the working conditions of workplace. Hugo Munsterberg is the pioneer in industrial psychology. He suggested psychological tests for employee selection, learning theory concepts for employee training, and study of human behavior for employee motivation. Mary Parker is one of the first to recognize that organization could be viewed from the perspective of individual and group behavior. He proposed more people-oriented ideas than scientific management followers. According to him, organizations should be based on group ethics. While Chester Barnard is actual manager, who thought that organizations were social systems and required cooperation, he believed manager's job was to communicate and stimulate employee high levels of efforts. Remember, he was first to argue that Organizations were open system. Another important contributor in behavioral approach are Hawthorne studies. These were a series of studies conducted at Western Electric Company in Cicero. These studies were initially designed by Western Electric Industrial Engineers as a scientific management experiment. They wanted to examine the effect of various lighting levels on worker production. However, they found that as the level of light was increased in experimental group, output for both groups increased. The most surprising thing for the engineers was, as the light level was decreased in the experimental group, productivity continued to increase in both groups. In fact, a productivity decrease was observed in experimental group only when the level of light was reduced so much. So, the findings of this experiment were, the lighting intensity was not directly related to group productivity and sometimes, and something else must have contributed to results. However, 
they were not able to pinpoint what that something else was. Ironically, the researchers concluded that social norms, group standards, and attitudes more strongly influence individual output and work behavior. Managers use behavioral approach in contemporary world from way to work with employees to way to communicate. Much OB advocates propose and conclude that Hawthorne studies provided foundation for current theories of motivation, leadership, group behavior and development, and numerous other behavior approaches. Contemporary approach is further divided in two different approaches. First one is system approach and second one is contingency approach. In fact, a system is a set of interrelated and interdependent parts. There are two basic types of system. First one is closed systems and second one is open system. Closed system are not influenced and do not interact with the environment. Means all system input and output is internal, while open systems dynamically interact to their environments by taking inputs and transferring them into outputs that are distributed into their environments. The implications of system approach are first, coordination in different parts of organization is essential for proper functioning for entire organization. Second, decisions and action taken in one area of organization will have an effect in other areas of organization. Third, organizations are not self-contained. Therefore, they must adopt to changes in their external environment. Contingency approach is also sometimes called situational approach. According to this approach, there is no one universally applicable set of management principles by which to manage the organization. And organizations are individually different, face different situations, and requires different ways of managing. The popular contingency variables are organization size, routineness of task technology, environmental certainty, and individual differences. So these were the major approaches to management that you must keep in mind, not just to get good scores in your relative exams, but also to comprehend this subject effectively. Organizational, internal and external environment. Internal environment. It is generally consists of those elements that exist within the organization and easier to control than external factors such as management, employee morale, culture, and financial factors. External environment. Those factors and forces outside the organization that affects its performance. There are some components of external environment like political and legal components that looks federal laws, state laws, local laws, global laws, and laws of other countries. It also consider political condition and stability of the country. Second, Demographic component that concern with trends in population characteristics like age, race, gender, education level, geographic location, income, family composition. Third, economic component that looks at interest rate, inflation, changes in disposable income, stock market fluctuations, business cycle stages. Fourth, Sociocultural component. It is concerned with societal and cultural factors such as values, attitudes, trends, traditions, lifestyles, beliefs, tastes, and patterns of behavior. Next, technological component that is concerned with scientific and industrial innovations. Last but not the least, global component that encompasses those issues associated with globalization and world economy. There are different global perspectives. For instance, 
parochialism, ethnocentric attitude, polycentric attitude, genocentric attitude. Similarly, there are different regional trading alliances and global trade mechanisms are the part of external environment. The examples of regional trading alliances are European Union, NAFTA, which means North American Free Trade Agreement, CAFTA, Central American Free Trade Agreement, ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, SARC, South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, and African Union, while the examples of global trade mechanism are World Trade Organization, IMF, International Monetary Fund, World Bank, OECD, which means Economic Cooperation and Development. Furthermore, different types of international organization are also part of global components, like MNCs, Multi Domestic Corporation, Global Company, Transactional or Borderless Organization. MNCs are all types of international organizations that operate in multiple countries. While multi domestic corporation is an MNC that decentralizes management and other decisions to local country. While global company is an MNC that centralizes management and other decisions in home country. Transactional or borderless organization is an MNC in which artificial geographical barriers are eliminated. This is all about global component of external environment. Management planning. Planning. It's a management function that involves setting goals, establishing strategies for achieving those goals, and developing plans to integrate and coordinate work activities. Management includes planning because planning provides direction, reduces uncertainty, minimizes waste and redundancy. It also sets standards for controlling. There are different types of plans as per breadth, time frame, specificity, frequency of use. In breadth, strategic plans are those which apply on entire organization. They establish organization overall goals. While operational plans encompass a particular operational area of the organization. In time frame, long term plans are those which cover a time frame beyond three years. In specificity, directional plans are flexible and set out general guidelines. While Specific plans are clearly defined and leave no room for interpretation. In frequency of use, single use plan is a one time plan specifically designed to meet the needs of a unique situation, while standing plans are ongoing plans that provide guidance for activities performed repeatedly. Goals are desired outcomes or targets of management planning. So let's have a look at types of goals. First, stated goals. These are the goals that are written in official statements of the organization. Second, real goals. These are the goals that actually pursued and defined by actions of members. Third, financial goals that are related to financial performance of the organization. Last, but not the least, strategic goals that are related to all areas of organization performance, especially competitors. Now, we have to understand different approaches in goal setting. First, traditional goal setting. It's an approach in which top managers set the goal that then flow down through the organization and become sub-goals for each organizational area. It means a top to bottom hierarchy is followed in traditional goal setting. Next, means and chain. It's an integrated network of goals in which accomplishment of goals at one level serve as the means for achieving the goals or ends at the next level. For instance, achievement of lower level goal 
is means by which to reach higher level goals or ends. Then, management by objectives or MBO. It's a process of setting mutually agreed upon goals and using those goals to evaluate employee performance. It is jointly determined, periodically reviewed, and rewards are allocated on the basis of progress toward the goals. Key elements of MBO are goal specificity, participative decision making, and explicit performance or evaluation period and feedback. Decision making. Decision is to make a choice from two or more alternatives. There is a process of decision making that involves different steps. Step number one, identifying the problem. A problem is a discrepancy between an existing and desired state of affairs. Characteristics of a problem. First, a problem becomes a problem when a manager becomes aware of it. Second, there is a pressure to solve the problem. Third, the manager must have the authority, information, or resources needed to solve the problem. Step number two, identifying the scene criteria. The scene criteria are the factors that are important and relevant to solve the problem. The factors could be the cost that will be incurred, risk likely to be encountered, and outcomes that are desired. Step number three, allocating weight to the criteria. The scene criteria are not of equal importance, means assigning a weight to each item places item in a correct priority order of their importance in decision making process. Step number four, developing alternatives, means identifying viable alternatives. Remember, alternatives are listed without evaluation that can resolve the problem. Step number five, analyzing alternatives, appraising each alternative strength and weakness in this step. An alternative appraisal is based on its ability to resolve the issues that is identified in step 2 and 3. Step number 6. Selecting an alternative means choosing the best alternative or you can say the alternative with the highest total weight is chosen. Step number 7. Implementing the alternative means putting the chosen alternative into action. Step number 8. Evaluating the decision effectiveness. It means the soundness of the decision is judged by its outcomes. In this step, we check how effective was the problem resolved by the outcomes resulting from the chosen alternative. Or, if the problem wasn't resolved, what went wrong? Being a student of management, we must have an idea regarding the biases and errors that managers commit during the decision making process. So, let's have a look at it. Our confidence bias. When decision makers tend to think they know more than they do or hold unrealistically positive views of themselves and their performance, they are exhibiting the overconfidence bias. The immediate gratification bias describes Decision makers who tend to want to immediate rewards and to avoid immediate costs. The anchoring effect describes how decision makers fixate on initial information as a starting point and then fail to adequately adjust for subsequent information. When decision makers selectively organize and interpret events based on their biased perception, they are using the selective perception bias. While in confirmation bias, the decision maker seek out information that reaffirm past choices and discounts contradictory information. In framing bias, the decision maker select and highlight certain aspects of a situation while ignoring other aspects. In availability bias, the decision makers tend to remember events that are most recent and vivid in their memory. In representation bias, the decision maker draw analogies and seek out identical situations where they don't exist. 
The randomness bias describes the actions of decision makers who try to create meaning out of random events. Sunk cost errors. The sunk cost error occurs when decision makers forget that current choices can't correct the past. In self-serving bias, the decision makers take quick credit for success and blaming outside factors in case of their failures. Finally, the hindsight bias is the tendency for decision makers to falsely believe that they would have accurately predicted the outcome of an event once that outcome is actually known. Now, we will discuss strategic management process. Strategic management means what managers do to develop organization strategies. Strategic management process is a process that encompasses strategic planning, implementation, and evaluation. There are different steps in the strategic management process. Step number one, develop vision and mission statement. Vision means what a business want to be, while mission is the purpose of an organization. Step number two, external environment analysis means the environmental scanning of specific and general environments. It focuses on identifying opportunities and threats. Step number three, internal environment analysis. In this step, organizational resources, capabilities, and activities are assessed. Strengths create value for customer and strengthen competitive position of firm, while weaknesses can place a firm at a competitive disadvantage. Remember, analyzing financial and physical assets is fairly easy, but assessing intangible assets like employee skills, culture, corporate reputation, and so on isn't so much easy for the manager. Step number two and step number three, collectively called SWOT analysis. In SWOT analysis, the organization trends, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats are assessed. Step number four. Establish long-term objective in which managers make smart goals or objectives for the firm. Step number five, generate, evaluate, and choose strategies. There are different types of strategies. And managers develop and evaluate strategic alternatives. Then select appropriate strategies for all levels in the organization that provide relative advantage over competitors and managers match organizational strengths to environmental opportunities and correct weaknesses and guard against threats. Implement strategies. Once strategies are formulated, they must be implemented, no matter how effectively an organization has planned its strategies. Performance will suffer if the strategies are not implemented properly. Step number seven, measure and evaluate performance. It's a final step in the strategic management process in evaluating results in which the results are evaluated. Like, how effectively have the strategies been at helping the organization reach its goal? What adjustments are necessary? And so on. Strategies are the decisions and actions that determine the long-run performance of an organization. There are different levels of organizational strategy. Corporate level strategies that determine what businesses a company is in or wants to be in and what it wants to do with those businesses. These are top management overall plan for entire organization and its strategic business units. SBU or strategic business unit is the single independent businesses of an organization that formulate their own competitive strategies. There are three types of corporate strategies. First, growth strategy means expansion into new products and markets. Second, stability means maintenance of status quo. Third, renewal strategy, which means redirection of firms into new markets through retrenchment or turnaround. The next is business level strategies or competitive strategies. These are organizational strategies for how an organization will compete in its businesses. A competitive advantage is what sets an organization apart from its competitors. According to five forces model, there are five competitive forces that dictate the rules of competition. First competitive force is threat of new entrant. Second, threat of substitutes. Third, bargaining powers of buyers. Fourth, bargaining powers of suppliers. Fifth, current rivalry.
Finally, functional level strategies that are used by an organization various functional departments to support the competitive strategy. Organizational structure and design. Organizational structure is the formal arrangement of jobs within an organization. An organization use organizational charts that are visual representation of organization structure. Organization design is a process involving decision about six key elements. First, work specialization means dividing work activities into separate job tasks. It's the degree to which tasks in the organization are divided into separate jobs with each step completed by a different person. Remember, over specialization can result in human diseconomies from boredom, fatigue, stress, poor quality, increased absenteeism, and high turnover. Second, departmentalization. It's the basis by which jobs are grouped together. There are Five forms of departmentalization like functional departmentalization, geographical departmentalization, product departmentalization, process departmentalization, customer departmentalization. Third, chain of command. It's the continuous line of authority that extends from upper level of an organization to the lowest level of organization that clarifies who reports to whom. There are three concepts that are important in chain of command. These are authority, responsibility, and unity of command. Authority is the right inherent in a managerial position to tell people what to do and to expect them to do it. While responsibility is the obligation or expectation to perform. And unity of command is the concept that a person should have one boss and should report only to that person. Fourth, span of control. It means the number of employees who can be effectively and efficiently supervised by a manager. Width of span is affected by skills and abilities of manager. Characteristics of work being done. Complexity of tasks. Standardization of tasks. Employee characteristics. Similarity of task and physical proximity of subordinate. Fifth, centralization and decentralization. Centralization is the degree to which decision making is centralized at a single point in an organization. In centralized organization, top managers make all decisions and low level employers simply carry out those orders. While in decentralized organization, Decision making is pushed down to managers who are closest to the action. Last, formalization is the degree to which jobs within an organization are standardized and extent to which employee behavior is guided by rules and procedures. Highly formalized jobs offer little discretion over what is to be done, while low formalization means fewer constraints on how employees do their work. Now, we will discuss designing adaptive organizations. There are four types of contemporary organizational designs. First, team structure. Second, matrix project structure. Third, boundaryless structure. Fourth, learning structure. So, let's discuss them in detail. Team structure is a structure in which the entire organization is made up of work groups, or teams. The advantages of team structures are the employees are more involved and empowered and there are reduced barriers among functional areas while the disadvantages of team structures are there are no clear chain of command and there is pressure on teams to perform the task. Second, matrix project structure. Matrix is a structure that assigns specialists from different functional areas to work on projects who then return to their areas when the project is completed. A project is a structure in which employees continuously work on projects. As one project is completed, employees move to the next project. The advantages of matrix project structure are it is fluid and flexible design. 
that can respond to environmental changes and it is a faster design making. The disadvantages of matrix project structures are there is complexity of assessing people to projects and task and personality conflicts are there in matrix project structure. Third, boundary less structure. It is a structure not defined by or limited to artificial horizontal, vertical or external boundaries. It includes virtual and network types of organizations. The advantages of boundary structures are it is highly flexible and responsive. Second, it utilizes talent whenever it found. The disadvantages of boundary structures are it lacks the control as well as there are communication difficulties in boundary structure. Learning structure. It is a structure in which employees continuously acquire and share new knowledge and apply that knowledge. Sharing of knowledge throughout the organization is possible in learning structure. Furthermore, it provides sustainable source of competitive advantages. While the disadvantages of learning structure are, the employees are reluctant to share knowledge for fear of losing their power. Second, large number of experienced employees on the edge of retiring. Now, it's time to understand managing change and innovation in management. The question arises, what is change? Change is any alteration in the people, structure or technology of an organization. The characteristics of change, it is constant, yet varies in degree and direction. Second, it produces uncertainty, yet not completely unpredictable. Third, it creates both threats and opportunities. Remember, managing change is an integral part of every manager's job. Change is proud by change agents. In fact, change agents are the persons who act as catalyst and assumes responsibility for managing the change process. They can be managers, means internal entrepreneurs, non-managers, means change specialists, or outside consultants, means change implementation experts. There are different types of change, like change in structure, change in technology, change in people. There are two important change process viewpoints. First, the calm waters metaphor. Levine provided three-step change process. According to Levine, successful change can be planned and requires unfreezing the status quo, changing to a new state and refreezing to make the change permanent. The status quo is considered equilibrium. To move away from this equilibrium, unfreezing is necessary. Unfreezing can be thought of as preparing for needed change. It can be done by increasing the driving forces, which are forces pushing for change, by decreasing the restraining forces, which are the forces that resist change. Levine three-step process creates change as a move away from the organization current equilibrium state. It's a calm water scenario where an occasional disruption means planning and implementing change to deal with the disruption. Once the disruption has been dealt with, however, things continue on under the new change situation. This type of environment isn't what most managers face today. The second is wide water rapids metaphor. DJ Patel, who made weather patterns, says sometimes you can predict weather for 15 days, sometimes you can predict or forecast a couple of days, and sometimes you can predict next two hours. The business climate is turning out to be like two hour weather scenario. The lack of environmental stability and predictability requires the manager and organizations continually adapt or manage change actively to survive. So, pace of change in economy and culture is accelerating and over visibility about future declining.
Leadership is also one of the most important concept in management. Firstly, we have to understand who is leader. A leader is someone who can influence others and who has managerial authority. While leadership is a process of influencing a group to achieve goals. There are some early theories of leadership which are trait theories and behavioral theories. Research focused on identifying personal characteristics that differentiate leaders from non-leaders. Later, research focused on leadership process identified eight traits associated with successful leadership. These traits are drive, desire to lead, honesty and integrity, self-confidence, intelligence, job-relevant knowledge, extraversion, and proneness to guilt. Behavioral theories of leadership consist of nine studies that had been researched in different universities. Firstly, understand University of Lowa studies, which stated three behavioral dimensions. First is democratic style, which means involves subordinates, delegate authority, and encouraging participation. Second dimension is autocratic style, which dictates work methods, centralizing decision making, and limiting participation. Third dimension of University of Lowa is least fire style, which gives group freedom to make decisions and complete work. The conclusion of University of Lowa studies is democratic style of leadership was more effective, although later studies showed mixed results. Next is Ohio State studies, which stated two behavioral dimensions. First is consideration, means being considerate of followers' ideas and feelings, and the second is initiating structure, which means structuring work and work relationship to meet job goals. And the conclusion of Ohio State University was a leader, which is high in consideration and high in initiating structure, achieve high subordinate performance and satisfaction, but not in all situations. Next, University of Michigan studies, which also stated two behavioral dimensions. First is employee-oriented, which emphasize interpersonal relationships and taking care of employees' needs. Second, production-oriented, which emphasize technical or task aspect of job. The conclusion of this study was employee-oriented leaders were associated with high group productivity and high job satisfaction. Last study involved managerial grid that state two behavioral dimensions. First is concern for people and second is concern for production. Concern for people major, leader concern for subordinates on a scale of 1 to 9 means low to high, while concern for production major, leader concern for getting job done on a scale of 1 to 9, which also means low to high. The conclusion of managerial grid is a leader which high concern for production and high concern for people perform well. There are four types of contingency theories of leadership. First, the Fiedler model. It's a leadership theory that proposes effective group performance depends on the proper match between the leader style and the degree to which situation allows the leader to control and influence. In this model, least preferred co-worker questionnaire is used, which measure whether a leader is task-oriented or relationship-oriented. Second is situational leadership theory that is developed by Paul Hersey and Ken Blanchard. It is a leadership contingency theory that focuses on followers' readiness. Readiness means the extent to which followers have the ability and willingness to accomplish a specific task. This model posits four stages of follower readiness. First is R1, which means followers are unable and unwilling. R2 means followers are unable but willing. R3 means followers are able but unwilling. R4 which means followers are able and willing. Situational leadership theory views leader-follower relationship like parent and child. Just as a parent needs to relinquish control when a child becomes more mature and responsible. So leader do the same. Next is path goal model which stated that 
leadership goal is to assist his followers in attaining their goals and to provide direction to ensure that their goals are compatible with organizational goals. According to this model, leaders assume different leadership styles at different times depends upon their situation, like directive leader or sportive leader or participative leader or achievement oriented leader. Now we will discuss four contemporary views on leadership. First, leader member exchange theory, which says that leader create in groups and out groups and those who are in group will have high performance ratings, less turnover, and greater job satisfaction. Second, transformational, transactional leadership. Transactional leaders are the leaders who lead primarily by using social exchanges or transactions. Transactional leaders guide and motivate followers to work toward established goals by exchanging rewards for their productivity. While transformational leaders are the leaders who stimulate and inspire followers to achieve extraordinary outcomes. Third is charismatic or visionary leadership. Charismatic leader is an enthusiastic, self-confident leader whose personality and actions influence people to behave in certain ways. Visionary leadership is the ability to create and articulate a realistic, credible, and attractive vision of the future which will improve present situation. Last but not the least is team leadership. The role of team leader is difficult from the traditional leadership role. The characteristics of a team leader are it has patience to share information, it will be able to trust others and to give up authority, and he has understanding when to intervene as a coach, conflict manager, liaison, or troubleshooter. So it was all about leadership. Another important concept in management is motivation. It is a process by which a person's efforts are energized, directed, and sustained toward attaining a goal. You observe, there are three key elements of this definition, energy, direction, and persistence. Energy element is a measure of intensity, drive, or vigor. This high level of effort needed to be directed in ways that help organization to achieve its goal. And employees must persistent in putting forth effort to achieve those goals. Remember, motivation works best when individual needs compatible with organizational goals. There are four early theories of motivation. First, Maslow hierarchy of needs theory. Maslow was a psychologist who proposed five needs in a hierarchy. First, psychological needs. For instance, food, drink, shelter, sex, and other physical requirements. Next, you will find safety needs in this hierarchy. It means a person need for security and protection from physical and emotional harm. Third is social needs like affection, belongingness, acceptance, and friendship. Next, you will find esteem needs in this hierarchy, which means self-respect, autonomy, and achievement. External esteem factors are also included in esteem needs, such as status, recognition, and attention. Last but not the least, self-actualization needs, which means a person need for growth, achieving one potential, and self-fulfillment. In fact, the drive to become what one is capable of becoming. Second theory is McGregor Theory X and Theory Y. According to Theory X, employees dislike work and they are lazy. They avoid responsibility. So they must be coached to perform or forced to perform. While Theory Y assumes that employees are creative, enjoy work, seek responsibility, and can exercise self-direction. McGregor believed that theory Y assumption should guide management practice and proposed that participation in decision making, responsible and challenging jobs, and good group relations would maximize employee motivation. Third theory is Herzberg two factor theory, which is also known as motivational hygiene theory. This theory proposed that intrinsic factors are related to job satisfaction, 
while extrinsic factors are associated with job dissatisfaction. Hygiene factors are the extrinsic or environmental factors that create job dissatisfaction. For instance, supervision, company policy, relationship with supervisors, peers or subordinates, working condition, salary, personal life, status and security. While the motivators are the intrinsic or psychological factors having to do with the job itself. For instance, achievement, recognition, work itself, responsibility, advancement, and growth. Lastly, David McLean and his associates proposed three needs theory, which says three acquired needs are major motives in work. These three are the need for achievement which means the drive to excel and succeed. Second, the need for power, which means need to influence behavior of others. Third, need for affiliation, which means the desire for friendly and close interpersonal relationships. There are also some contemporary theories of motivation. First, it says that setting goals that are accepted, specific, and challenging yet achievable will result in higher performance than having no or easy goals. Second, reinforcement theory, which says that the behavior is a function of its consequences. Those consequences that immediately follow a behavior and increase the probability that the behavior will be repeated are called reinforcers. Third, designing motivating jobs. Job design is the way into which tasks are combined to form complete jobs. There are some factors that influence job design. These factors could be changing organizational structure, organizational technology, employee skills, ability and preferences. Remember, job enlargement and job enrichment are used while designing job. Job enlargement means to increase the scope of job, number of frequency of tasks, or it's a horizontal expansion, while job enrichment means increase responsibility and autonomy in a job, or you can say it's a vertical expansion. In designing jobs, JCM is followed. JCM stands for Job Characteristics Model. The five core job dimensions of this model are skill variety, task identity, task significance, autonomy, and feedback. Equity theory is developed by Stacey Adams, which proposed that employees compare what they get from a job in relation to what they put into it, and then they compare their input-output ratio with reference. Reference is an important variable in equity theory, which means the other person, systems, or self-individuals compare themselves against in order to assess equity. The person category includes other individuals with similar jobs in the same organization but also includes friends, neighbors, or professional associates. Similarly, the system category includes organizational pay policies, procedures, and allocation. The self category refers to inputs outputs ratios that are unique to the individuals. Lastly, Expectancy theory stated that an individual tends to act in a certain way based on the expectation that the act will be followed by a given outcome and on attractiveness of that outcome to the individual. It includes three variables of relationship. First, expectancy or effort performance linkage. Second, instrumentality or performance reward linkage. Third, valence or attractiveness of reward. Valence consider both the goals and needs of the individual. So it was all about motivation. That is also a very important concept in management. <music>